Good afternoon from Dubai and welcome to Tech Talk. The topic of today is the rise and limit of AI in recruiting talent. It's great to see many alumni, staff, students, faculty, and friends of INSEAD attending from all around the world. My name is Pascal Balze and I am your host today. So I am also the producer of this Tech Talk series. This series is part of Digital at INSEAD and is conducted in partnership with Accenture. Digital at INSEAD is an initiative to advance INSEAD research, teaching, and outreach on global digital transformation. Tech Talks are dedicated to exploring existing and new digital technology and their application, as well as impact on management, business, and society. So if you're interested to know more, please visit digital.inseat.edu. So Stewart teaches global leadership and strategy. He is also truly global. He has lived and worked literally all around the world, in Japan, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Switzerland. He is now based in the US and supports INSEAD growing presence in South and North America, as well as the INSEAD New Innovation Hub in San Francisco. His work is at the intersection of strategy and leadership, and this is precisely our topic today, AI and human capital. AI is one of the most important strategic developments in recent years and likely to be in many years to come. And on the other hand, most executives claim that human capital is the most important asset. So on AI and human capital, Stewart has conducted research, he has written case studies, and consulted with a large number of firms and globally, and uh, how AI is affecting the recruitment, selection, succession, deployment, and development of talent. His work has been widely published in academic and practitioner journals. So now it is time to hear more from Stewart's research. Stewart, the stage is yours. Great, thank you. Well, thank you for that introduction. Um, I, I suspect if you're like most of the executives that I speak with, you increasingly find it uh, difficult as well as important to recruit both the right number as well as uh, the right quality of talent. Uh, in part because increasingly talent makes a significant difference in terms of organizational performance. And everyone has an interest in AI these days, especially in terms of human capital, not the least of which is getting the talent you need to your firm. And that's really the agenda for today. I'll talk just a little bit about what are the benefits of AI in recruiting, but also some of the limits. What are the constraints of AI when it comes to recruiting people? And then we'll end with uh, a quick uh, review of some of the key implications for your business. But to do this, let's go back in time just a couple of hundred years and think about ways that we moved goods, right? You go back a couple of hundred years, this was the primary mechanism, horse and carriage uh, wagon for moving goods. And uh, then a new invention came along, the steam train. And we all know that it dominated once it came into existence. And why? Very simply, it was faster, cheaper, and better. Well, fast forward a couple of hundred years and think about ways of recruiting. And again, it comes down to sort of two technologies. One is an analog technology, humans, and the other is AI. Um, and it turns out that when it comes to recruiting, guess what? AI is faster, cheaper, and better. So I'm going to review at least some of the highlights in terms of this, but the simple framework is when it comes to recruiting, there's sort of six uh, activities. One is identifying the talent. Once you've identified it, you got to entice them to apply. Once they apply, you need to screen them and, and uh, sort of get sort through those that you want and those that you don't want. After screening, then you need to dive into a deeper assessment in terms of uh, key qualifications, et cetera. Even once you've done that assessment, there's all sorts of assistance that needs to be done. Uh, candidates, qualified candidates have questions about your uh, benefits package, et cetera. And then 
The last step, AI can also be useful in terms of initial interviews. So I'm going to look at these six areas and at least uh, provide a high level uh, review and some key examples um, of companies and what they've achieved with AI. So as I said, identifying AI is particularly helpful in uh, scrubbing uh, job boards, job aggregators, to look for active candidates, people who are actively looking for jobs that fit your requirements. AI is also incredibly helpful in terms of scrubbing uh, social media, net professional network platforms, and finding passive uh, candidates. Uh, so as an example, Unilever used a particular AI platform uh, and increased its diversity from uh, about 840 universities to over 2,600 universities. Uh, obviously, if you were using sort of analog recruiters, people, to go out to 2,600 universities, it would just simply be cost prohibitive. Uh, L'Oreal used a platform and was able to identify 2 million candidates for 5,000 uh, intern opportunities. So it can be tremendously uh, impactful, efficient, and effective in terms of identifying candidates. But as I said, once you've identified them, you need to entice them to actually apply. While Johnson & Johnson was finding it quite difficult to get females to apply. So they used the platform Textio, uh, which was very good in terms of machine learning and discovering which words, descriptions, phrases, et cetera, uh, and if it's a consequence of those changes, uh, Johnson & Johnson attracted 90,000 female candidates, additional candidates just in one year. L'Oreal had the opposite problem. It was having difficult attracting male candidates. So again, it used the same AI platform, Textio, and achieved uh, a never before uh, accomplished even split between males and females. So AI can be extraordinarily helpful in figuring out words, wording, uh, phrases that entice your targeted uh, candidates to actually apply. Well, once they apply, then there still needs some screening that has to happen. AI is incredibly efficient, and I'll give you a couple examples in terms of doing this. So for example, Hilton used a platform uh, in terms of screening uh, candidates, uh, housekeeping, front desk, et cetera. And in the process, reduced its hiring time from 42 to five days. To appreciate the benefit of this, imagine you're a housekeeper looking to work for a hotel in the back office, and you get an offer from Hilton in five days after you apply. Are you likely to wait another 37 days to see if you get an offer from Marriott? I don't think so. You take the offer and run, and that's exactly the benefit that Hilton has enjoyed through this. L'Oreal was able to take the screening time from 40 minutes to four minutes per candidate, and with no reduction in quality in terms of the candidates who were screened. So this is just a couple of examples of the power of AI when it comes to screening. Well, even after you screen candidates and get it down to a narrower group, there's still often some assessment that you need to do, deeper assessment of people's capabilities, uh, maybe characteristics, personality profile, et cetera. So a simple example of that is McKinsey, the big consulting firm. So in the analog days, they used to give candidates at this stage of the recruiting process, case studies. And then a panel of analog humans would uh, listen to the candidates in terms of their analysis, how they interpreted the data, the decisions they would make, the recommendations, and based on that, assess candidates and make recommendations. Well, they switched and now they use a simulation and rather than a panel of analog humans, an AI algorithm tracks uh, the data that candidates focus on, how long they look at particular data, uh, the decisions they make, the particular data they use in incorporating 
into making those decisions, their recommendations, et cetera, and then tracks all of that and relates it to the profiles of their highest performing uh, consultants to make recommendations based on these AI assessments. Well, as I said, even after you do this assessment, there's all sorts of assistance that needs to be done. Candidates have questions. So a Latin American firm I worked with used an AI platform uh, that had chatbots. So candidates who had been assessed and had questions uh, went online and those chatbots were able to answer 67% of all the questions that people ask, which had a knock-on effect of incre increasing the HR productivity by 24%. So even after their questions are answered, at least uh, most companies do some preliminary interviews. And AI can be extraordinarily helpful here. So AI has the ability now to uh, even conduct the interview, uh, pose the questions, and then record the micro facial movements, uh, tone of voice, word choice, et cetera, uh, to make recommendations on the appropriateness of that candidate for the job based on the interview. So again, a simple example, Unilever used HireVue uh, for the initial interviews of 40,000 candidates. The interesting thing is based on HireVue's uh, AI algorithm and recommendation, they went from about 65% under the old system where there were humans making the recommendation being given final offers to 80% of those coming out of the higher view process and recommendation being made final offer. So not only was it more efficient, but it was actually more effective uh, than the humans who are highly trained and highly experienced before. So look, uh, when it comes to the utility of some new technologies, one of the things I like to do is follow the money, right? So if you look at uh, venture capital money going into startups and firms who are focusing specifically on AI and recruiting, we see just an explosion of funding for these activities. It's well over $5 billion being invested in these sort of startups, okay? So you go to the other side and ask companies, uh, small, medium, and large, uh, are you planning to use this? So a research uh, study was done in 2019, looking forward to actually this year, 2021, basically just two questions. What's your level of awareness? And do you plan to adopt these new AI enabled recruiting tools? So for small firms, sort of zero to 25 recruiters, uh, in terms of awareness, sort of roughly uh, three quarters, and most of them plan to adopt. For medium-sized firms, a bit higher awareness and a bit higher uh, sort of commitment to use, about three quarters. For large firms, over 90% awareness and 85% of them plan to adopt these uh, AI-enabled recruiting tools over the next couple of years. So there's massive momentum, and it's come along just in literally the last five years. So when you look at all this, it's really quite compelling that AI is faster, cheaper, and better than humans when it comes to recruiting. It seems like a simple story. If we just stop there, you would say, well, we should just adopt it. But it's a little more complicated. So earlier I talked about uh, steam engines, right? And if I were to ask you how critical were steam engines in the industrial revolution, all of you would correctly say they were incredibly uh, critical. However, the story is a little more complicated, okay? Because if you look at why steam engines were so critical, there were some particular preconditions that amplified this as, as well as surrounding conditions. So at least two preconditions. One, where we developed the ability to make steel rails that were strong enough to hold the weight of steam engines and long enough and straight enough that they could be used on train tracks. 
In addition, civil engineering developed to the point where they could lay out and lay down the tracks for trains. Without these preconditions, even though trains could run theoretically constantly at the pace that a horse could only uh, sustain for a few minutes, none of that potential would be actualized without these two preconditions. Okay? There are a number of surrounding conditions, but arguably the most important was uh, factories. So before factories, we had cottage industries and small cottages produced a small volume of product. That small volume didn't have to travel very far or very fast, which is why horse and cart were perfectly adequate, until it would find enough people where demand met that small supply. Well, with factories, they produced a significantly bigger supply, and that supply had to travel farther and faster before it met enough people for demand to equal that supply. And again, that surrounding condition is what amplified and in fact actualized the theoretical potential of steam engines. Well, similar uh, sort of case exists for AI, especially in the context of uh, human capital and recruiting people. There are some key preconditions as well as surrounding conditions that take this latent potential and actually actualize it. So in terms of preconditions, one of the key things is in the quote unquote analog days, there was quite a bit of friction between matching up jobs and candidates. With digitalization, I guess I can't say that that friction disappeared, but it dramatically was reduced, okay? Then in terms of digitalization, the other precondition is people digitize themselves. Uh, so Facebook now has something like 2.7 billion monthly active users. Instagram has a billion. Uh, LinkedIn has 766 million uh, members on, uh, on LinkedIn. So when you think about these preconditions, let me just share a few statistics that sort of highlight this. So now about one in four of your current employees is actually actively looking for a new job and a new company, okay? In terms of jobs that are posted online, on average now there are 250 candidates for every one job posted. Now, when I give this figure, people are often just astounded. Um, and you wonder how can there be so many candidates? Well. The reduction in friction is primarily responsible for this because as a candidate, if it, uh, there's no risk in trying, there's really no cost in applying, so why not? And they do, and that's what really accounts for this high ratio. However, because it's so easy, 70 to 80% of candidates who apply for our jobs online are unqualified. And again, it's easy to explain. Uh, it costs me nothing, so why not roll the dice, okay? However, the other side of the coin, as I said, there are 2.7 billion people on Facebook, a billion people on Instagram. So they're passive candidates. However, my research and others have demonstrated that 75 to 85% of passive candidates meaning they're satisfied enough, they're not actively looking for a job, are still willing to entertain unsolicited job opportunities. Now that's really significant, okay? So if you think about uh, the analog uh, human recruiters, 250 candidates for every one job, uh, it's just not feasible. Uh, it's not practical, right, for people to sift through that. Then if you think about 2.7 billion potential passive candidates, it's just not possible, let alone economical, for people to do all of that scouring and scrubbing of that data to find the right passive candidates for your job. So 
all of these preconditions not only actualize AI, but almost insist on AI because humans just can't keep up with this. Okay. So there's one at least preliminary implication of just what I've covered thus far. Because of these preconditions, roughly half to sort of two thirds of your employees are now poachable through AI. And I'll come back to this uh, towards the end. But uh, for many companies, that's quite a, a disturbing statistic to think that half to two thirds of your employees are sitting there and through AI now can be identified, targeted, enticed, screened, et cetera, all at low cost to the, if you will, raider who's trying to steal those employees from you, as well as the employees themselves. So those are the key preconditions that sort of amplify both the utility and the need for AI. But then there are some surrounding conditions that also amplify the utility of AI. I put them all in the sort of general context of War for Talent. And last year, I published a book called Competing for and with Human Capital that really zeroes in on this. And these three uh, sort of surrounding conditions, I think uh, we can get a sense of this if we just do a quick survey. So we're going to launch this poll. Uh, I'm going to ask you seven questions. You just have to answer yes or no. Okay. So, and I'm only going to give you a very uh, quick couple of seconds. So first, um, are your people your most important as asset? Yes or no? Okay. Two, does your company seek to be the employer of choice in your industry? Yes or no? Three, is it harder these days than in the past to attract and retain the best talent? Yes or no? Next, does the quality of talent make an important difference in your company or organization's performance? Yes or no? Just a few more. Does your firm have a clear strategy for becoming the employer of choice? Be honest here, yes or no. Just two more. Does your firm have and use good metrics for determining how it's doing as an employer of choice? And probably the toughest question of all, number seven, do you hold managers and executives accountable for their success or failure in waging and winning the war for talent? Yes or no? All right, well, let's take a quick look at uh, your results. So uh, very quickly, well, 93%, yes, people are our most important uh, asset, okay? Do you seek to be the employer of choice? 81%, so quite uh, popular. Is it harder these days? Well, the vast majority, 77% say yes. Does the quality of talent make a difference in actual performance. 96% of you say yes, okay? Does your firm have a clear strategy? Oops, only 37% say yes. Do you have good metrics? Even a little bigger drop there, 31%. Do you hold managers accountable? Wow, 42% uh, say yes, but the majority say no. Well, this is quite a good group. Uh, let me show you the results I have from about 5,000 people like you answering this survey. Okay. So you can see, similar to you, virtually everyone says, yes, people are our most important asset. However, unlike this group, if you look at question seven, the vast majority of companies do not hold executives and managers accountable for their success or failure in winning the war for talent, okay? So we have this war for talent, but for most firms, they're not doing very well at it, okay? Well, it's one thing to have surveys or opinions, but is there empirical evidence that in fact there is a war for talent? 
does this surrounding condition in general really exist? Well, let me give you some data, at least from the US where we, uh, the Department of Labor uh, collects monthly data that's quite useful for addressing this. Because fundamentally we wanna look at demand and supply of labor. Well, if you take job openings as demand and hires as supply, here's what we know. Obviously, if you have greater demand than supply, you have a seller's market and a market for employees, if you will. Conversely, if supply exceeds demand, you have a buyer's market, a company's market. So here's the monthly data. And we can see coming out of the 2000, the dot-com bomb, right? And the recession that then followed, obviously it became increasingly a buyer's market, an employee's market. Then we began to recover until about uh, 2008. We had the financial crisis, then the subsequent great recession. And again, it declined and became much more a buyer's market. Well, then coming out of that, things got better and better until about 2014, when we crossed this threshold of actually demand uh, exceeding supply and continued that through about 2017, 2018, it began to taper off. And then of course the pandemic uh, dropped to the lowest levels, at least that we've seen in modern history. However, if you look very carefully at the data, you see that in the end, the, towards the end of 2020 and in the first three months of 2021, we've bounced back significantly and now are back in a seller or employee market. Well, another way to look at it is quits, that is people who voluntarily leave their job and their company, so they're not fired, they voluntarily leave, as a percentage of hires. Obviously, you're not gonna leave your job unless you feel like the job market is very strong, okay? So again, we see this pattern of uh, the market uh, getting more and more difficult coming out of the recession and improved. Then we hit the financial crisis. And again, uh, the subsequent great recession, I guess we call it. Things dramatically improved until we hit the pandemic and then they recover. Now we'll see, does it sort of taper off? Does it continue to go up? Uh, only time will tell, but even on this metric, What's interesting is even though there are still lots of problems from an employment standpoint, we're back to a war for talent, demand exceeding supply. So demographics or economics in terms of uh, balance of labor supply and demand always matter in a war for talent, okay? But as you saw from those figures, it can move up and down. What I wanna highlight next are three surrounding conditions that may be even more important than sort of fluctuating labor supply and demand, in part because these three conditions uh, don't look like they're gonna move around and don't look like they're going to reverse themselves, okay? So the first is employees today are more valuable than ever. And I'll talk in a minute about why. Second, employees now can know their value faster and clearer than ever before. And I'll talk about why that's happened. And third, employees can capture that value easier, better than ever before, okay? And these three uh, almost seismic shifts really amplify both the utility and need for AI and recruiting. So let me talk about each one of them very quickly. More valuable. Why are employees more valuable than ever before? And it's really because there's been an inversion in the source of firm value. So if we simplify it, a firm can get value from its tangible assets, so plant, equipment, property, things like that, as well as intangible assets. So things like innovation, customer service, speed to market, et cetera. When we look at this relationship over time, here's what we discover. If you go back 20, 30 years ago, the vast majority of firm value came from its tangible assets, its plant, equipment, property, et cetera. Uh, 40 years ago, 
80% of a firm's value came from those tangible assets. Only roughly 20% came from intangible assets. And over time, we've seen an inversion of this till today, about 70% of the average firm's value comes from intangible assets, okay? And you say, so what? What, what difference and does that make and how does that relate to our topic for today? Well, people either are the sum and substance of intangible assets or they're the principal driver. So take something like innovation, right? For many companies, it's an extremely valuable intangible asset. Take people out of innovation. What do you have left? Not much, okay? So for most intangible assets, as I say, people are its essence. Now, here's an important sort of knock-on effect. Firms own their tangible assets. They own their plants or equipment, property, et cetera. They don't own their people. And as a consequence, legally, rivals can't come and steal your tangible assets, but legally they can come and steal your talent. Okay. That makes them extraordinarily both more valuable and more vulnerable, okay? So because employees are more valuable than ever before, right, because they drive firm value, this amplifies the utility of AI because AI, as we just went through, is extraordinarily efficient and effective in finding the talent that adds value to the firm, okay? Well, it's not that they just add more value, they know their value more now. So in economic terms, we used to say that employers had information asymmetry advantage. What does that mean? It's very simple. It used to be that firms knew much, much more than employees about uh, labor, supply, demand, wages, et cetera. It's no longer true. Now, in like 10 minutes, for free, employees can know almost as much as employers. So you've got sites like Vault and Glassdoor and Salary.com. I mean, the tagline for Salary.com is, what is your value? Okay. But actually, now it's even more than just getting a sense of uh, what could I get paid at another company for doing similar work. Uh, it can tell you another company in another region, uh, but not only that, now Vault, as an example, can give you a complete scorecard. So this happens to be PwC, but it can tell you overall how this company scores. It can tell you, of course, the salary for the type of work that you do. It can give the company scores in terms of uh, development, uh, diversity, et cetera. So the amount of information that employees can get now about the value they add is leaps and bounds beyond what it was just say 10 years ago. And you may say, okay, but why, why does that really matter? Well, go and talk to a new car dealer, okay? It used to be that car dealers knew much more about the supply, demand, average selling price of cars than a customer. Okay. Today, because of these uh, sites, et cetera, now customers walk into a showroom, they know almost as much as the dealer does. And so dealers have lost their asymmetric information advantage. And you say, okay, so, well, so customers have leveraged that new knowledge into greater uh, negotiation power and the average margin on a new car as a consequence has dropped in half. And so the same process is going on between employers and employees. Now employees can know their value and know it quickly and know it for almost free. And as a consequence, this amplifies the utility of AI because it can help you recruit the valuable talent that you need. And you need every advantage you can get because now employees uh, have access to information that sort of levels the playing field, okay? 
Well, the third one, not only can do employees add more value, not only can they know their value, now they can capture that value easily, more easily. Why? Because their switching costs have dropped dramatically. So how do we know this? Well, let me give you one uh, concrete empirical example. So if you take an age group, 45 uh, to 54 year olds, right? So old enough that uh, they're far enough into their career that there's some motivation, incentive, almost momentum to stay where they are. However, they're young enough that there's still some career runway left that if their switching costs were actually lower, they could and you would see them move. Well, what have we seen over time? Um, if we've seen increasing switching behavior, we should see for this age group, shorter and shorter uh, tenures, that is time in company. And guess what? That's exactly what we see. We've dropped from an average of 13 years for this age group now to down to eight years, a significant drop in terms of this. So that's evidence that they have lower switching costs, therefore higher switching behavior, Okay, so they can capture their value easier. So now you need AI and its efficiency and effectiveness to cope with this greater churn, okay? So when we think about the preconditions, they amplify the utility and need for AI. And when we think about these three surrounding conditions, the fact that employees add more value, they can more easily know the value they add and because of lower switching costs, they can more easily capture that value. So you need AI, in other words, to compete with these surrounding conditions, to find the employees, entice them, screen them, assess them, uh, assist them, and interview them. Okay. However, AI does have limitations and important limitations. And those limitations primarily go to human nature, okay? So as I said, AI can be extraordinarily helpful in terms of getting the quantity and quality of talent to your door, both efficiently and effectively, okay? However, the war for talent isn't won until people go through the door, okay? And it's not sustained until people stay inside the door. Well, that means you have to get the people you want to want you. Okay? You have to get the people you want to want you. So AI is, get it, is great at getting them to the door. It may help you extraordinarily in terms of who you want to hire, but at the end of the day, after you make the offer, someone has to say yes to it, okay? And here's what we know. When it comes to getting the candidates you want to want you or the current employees to stay with you, it really comes down to three factors which are quite human, not artificial in nature. One is your company, essentially its reputation and its culture, okay? The second is your leaders. Uh, both at the top as well as those who are proximate uh, to the candidates. The third is the job, both what candidates do and who they do it with, who they work with. Okay? Those three factors account for the vast majority of why people join an organization or stay with an organization. Okay? And all the AI in the world can't overcome a caustic company or our lousy leaders or junky jobs. Okay. Now, it might show up in the Q&A, so let me just anticipate it, because I often at this stage when I'm talking with executives, I say, yeah, but what about money? Certainly, money must matter. Okay. It does. However, compensation transparency is increasing to the point that money matters, but it is less and less the differentiator. Okay. For all that I've talked about before, it's much easier to know what the compensation is at other companies, other locales, et cetera. 
So it's almost, I guess the easiest analogy is airlines. Now, in a matter of minutes, you can see what the price is from going to point A to point E on any airline that flies that route. As a consequence, the price difference over the last uh, 15 years has come down. So there are still price differences, but compared to 15 years ago, they're much, much smaller, right? Because tr price transparency forces that uh, consolidation and compression. Price compression is the easiest way to say it. Well, the same thing has happened with employee compensation. There's so much transparency that the differences between firms is being compressed. So again, does money matter? Of course. And can you offer enough money that people will take your job? Of course you can, okay? But increasingly it's less the differentiator, okay? And these three other factors are really what's driving people's decision to join an organization. And as I said, to stay with an organization, okay? Now, here's the interesting thing. It used to be, okay, in sort of the analog days and certainly before AI, that your employees who are satisfied enough not to actively go looking for a new job and a new employer were basically safe from poaching by other firms, okay? Uh, only really your sort of high paid, uh, high profile executives were worth a rival going after. Uh, because the only way to do it was really to employ an executive search firm and typically charge one third of the first year's annual compensation. And even then, these search firms, their proprietary databases had uh, important limitations in terms of identifying passive candidates. Well, it's no longer true today. Anybody with sort of any meaningful digital footprint on social media or professional networks like uh, LinkedIn are now identifiable and reachable, okay? And AI makes that possible. The fact that there are a billion people on Instagram is a limitation for analog recruiters. It's not a limitation for digital AI uh, recruiters, okay? So as a consequence, and here's one of the really important implications, if you don't use AI-enabled recruiting tools, you simply leave your employees vulnerable to the raids of rivals AI-enabled tools. So as a consequence, actually, there's a brewing arms race when it comes to AI-enabled recruiting tools, okay? For all the reasons that we found arms raced in the past, that is, if you don't use it and uh, your rival does, you suffer significantly, plus you don't gain, well, which is the perfect incentive to use it and use it more, and then your rival use it more. So we're in this sort of, uh, if you will, amplifying cycle of uh, AI enabled uh, recruiting tools arms race, okay? So as we, come out of COVID-19 with that fading, as you saw from the statistics, we're back to a seller's market, okay? Employees now have more leverage than they've ever had before because of these three seismic shifts or surrounding conditions. Uh, they're unlikely to reverse, right? Are we gonna go back to the days when tangible assets accounted for most of a firm's value? It seems highly unlikely, okay? We're going to go back to the days when employees couldn't access their value. Are these sites, et cetera, going to fade away? Hardly likely. Okay. Um, so these three surrounding conditions are going to amplify the benefits of AI enabled recruiting tools. And as I said, as a consequence, we're really in the midst of an arms race to employ and deploy these tools. Here's the ironic thing. AI cannot win the final mile of the race it forces you to run. It's worth repeating. AI cannot win the final mile of the race that it forces you to run. You have to use AI-enabled recruiting tools these days. 
If you don't, as I said, you simply leave your people vulnerable to everybody else's use of it. However, it can get people to the door, but at the end of the day, candidates have to say yes. And in fact, current employees every day have to say yes to their current employee value proposition. Do I want to stay with this firm? Okay. You have to get the people you want to want you and continually want you. Okay. And people say yes to that value proposition, not for artificially intelligent capabilities, but for entirely authentic human characteristics. Okay. So let me pause here and uh, see what questions we might have. All right, thank you very much, very much, Stewart, for really a very, very interesting insight. Um, okay, so we have an incredible audience. We have a lot of questions that have come in. I think our audience is actually quite concerned. Uh, but before we start, um, some precision. We have a question from uh, Professor Felipe Montero, one of your colleagues. And uh, he just wants to know, uh, overall, uh, are you we talking about you? I mean, are we talking about US data or did you actually also use data from other countries? Uh, so the empirical data I gave on terms of the job market is from the US. Uh, the US Labor Department is arguably one of the best in keeping uh, track of this. But the opinion data, the 5,000 uh, survey data that I gave is from all over the world. Um, and so the war for talent is not just a US phenomenon, though uh, the data to support it is probably strongest there, but the opinion data, as I said, comes from all around the world, uh, literally uh, 5,000 people across uh, Asia, Europe, uh, North and South America. And did you see any differences between regions? So it's pretty similar. Uh, look, it's quite similar. Um, though countries that have uh, declining workforce populations, so Japan, Germany, and even China, people uh, don't know this, but uh, China's working population over the next 50 years is going to drop by almost 30%, similar to what we saw in Japan. Uh, well, when supply goes down, unless demand goes down commensurately, what do you have? You have a war for talent. So it's actually higher in some Asian and European countries where we have this uh, demographic decline in the number of uh, people who are in the working population, which is essentially uh, 16 to 64. Mm, interesting. All right. Then, uh, okay. So there's a lot of uh, employees and uh, employee concerns for us and employers, I think, in the audience. So we have a question from Susanna. It's how much AI is used in executive recruiting in more senior positions? Uh, yeah. So this is an interesting thing. And talking to companies like Corn Ferry, uh, they, they completely understand they're caught in sort of a difficult position at the moment, right? Because uh, their livelihood was based on proprietary databases and that human connection, right? Uh, talking to senior executives uh, who are passive candidates and essentially, if I'm blunt about it, talking them into considering an opportunity at another firm, okay? Well, that doesn't go away. But then there's a whole area from middle management on down where uh, AI is so much more e efficient and effective than humans that if uh, executive first search firms don't move in that direction, they'll essentially be squeezed up into only the highest echelons of recruiting. So many of them are beginning to experiment with this, right? Um, so where it will go is hard to predict uh, other than there is a human element at the highest levels that uh, I don't predict will go away anytime soon. I don't think AI is gonna take over the CEO recruiting space, uh, at least not in the next five to 10 years. But for middle managers, senior managers, we already see AI being very effective in that space. 
All right, I think we're going to have a lot of concerns, uh, MBA students uh, at the end of this talk. All right, okay, then we have a question from uh, Stephen, um, and it's about um, basically uh, gaming the system. Uh, so in the screening process, so have you learned about cases in which candidates try to game the system by using specific keywords to get yeah. ahead? And we have a similar question at senior level candidate, how can I get found and selected? How to optimize my profile on LinkedIn and on my CV? Uh, look, uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, algorithms are algorithms, right? Um, and they look for keywords, et cetera. They're getting more sophisticated to look not just for keywords, uh, but now to actually interpret a sentence syntax. So you don't even have to use the word uh, bold, right? I'm a bold person. Uh, they can look at the challenges that you faced in natural sentences and deduce that, okay? Uh, they can look at, uh, they meaning the algorithms, can look at your photographs on Facebook and essentially look at how many photographs is just you versus you with other people and from that infer how self-centered versus team-centered you might be. Wow. So of course there are ways to game it, but as you try and game it, uh, AI is getting more sophisticated um, and sort of keeping ahead of that game. Plus then, even if you get through initial screening, and as I said, AI is incredibly efficient in terms of that screening, at the assessment level, then it's really hard to game it, okay? So I mentioned the McKinsey one, maybe it's worth just a few more details um, because it was quite a fine art for the human evaluators to look at someone who was given a case study, how they analyzed it, what data they used, what the inferences they drew, what decisions they made, how quickly, et cetera. And they tried to relate that to their best consultants to then decide you know, of these people who did this case study, who would we recommend that we hire? Well, with AI, it can track which data you focus on, how long you focus on that data, which data points you incorporate into your decision, how quickly you make that decision at levels of accuracy that humans can't even approach. Plus then can look systematically at those, if you will, assessment profiles and map them against McKinsey's most effective consultants. Well, gaming that is almost impossible because you would need to know in advance what are all the capabilities, et cetera, of McKinsey's most successful consultants. Well, if you knew that, <laughs> you wouldn't have to game the game. So uh, yes, there are aspects of uh, the AI enabled process that you can game, but as you game it, it's getting better and better. And then there are certain aspects, especially later in the recruiting process during assessment, where it's really difficult, if not impossible, to game the game. Wow. All right. And then we have a question about adoption uh, from Benjamin. So how come HR will be willing to adopt such tools as they fear it will replace their jobs? So uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, so I, I've done some surveys on this, um, and, as well as interviews, and that fear is absolutely there. Um, but when you look at uh, what activities that AI replaces, the easiest, uh, the most efficient, the most effective, they're sort of early in the recruiting process. So for example, uh, identifying especially passive candidates. It doesn't replace anybody, why? Because humans weren't doing that uh, sort of identification anyway. No one was looking through 2.7 billion profiles on Facebook and trying to figure out, okay, which passive candidates fit my job requirements. So in that case, there's no fear because it's a new activity. It's not replacing something that someone did. However, screening was something that humans did. However, when you talk to recruiters about their activities, screening is not at the top of the list of the activities they enjoy the most, okay? And on average, I mean, when they have hundreds of resumes to look through, 
I mean, it's a very uh, repetitive and boring task. And now, as I said, with online applications being so easy to do, the number is uh, almost undoable, not possible for humans. So what does that mean? That means that if AI is doing that activity, which I don't really enjoy that much, plus now it's at such a volume, I can't do it and I can't do it well, that migrates me towards activities that actually I enjoyed more. Um, so the reality is the surveys I've done, HR uh, recruiters are not that fearful of AI and they're anticipating that AI will actually do some of the less appealing tasks, which will give them more time to do some of the more appealing tasks. Uh, so I anticipate that uh, the figures I gave you in terms of the survey uh, will actually come true, that HR departments will be, um, I, I think, reasonably responsive, and some will be aggressive. And as soon as more get aggressive, that's when we get into this uh, arms race that I talked about. Um, and I've already uh, had cases of companies where they've been attacked, I'll use that term, by a rival using AI-enabled tools and have saw, seen people leave who they just never expected. They thought they were completely satisfied. And they were satisfied enough that on their own, they weren't going to look for a job. But as I said, in my research and others, uh, roughly eight out of 10 people who are satisfied not enough, uh, enough not to look for a job when approached are willing to respond to that opportunity. Wow. All right. Okay. And then, um, so we have a question uh, from a small company and um, asking, you know, if AI, as AI has become, you know, cheap enough for, for small companies to start, you know, uh, leveraging AI in, uh, in recruiting talents. And, and the answer is yes. And you're going to see uh, a dramatic increase at the lower levels um, because uh, the, the fundamental, especially search and screening, and this is where small companies, in one sense, can't afford to spend a lot, right? If you're a fast food operator, right? You're a franchisee of McDonald's, let's say, but you just have one restaurant. Well, the reality is you always have had, and you have today, fairly high turnover, right? But you have to have, I mean, we don't have robots making hamburgers yet at McDonald's. You need people, okay? Um, and there are companies uh, today, I'm <laughs> working with one, that recognize that low-end opportunity where it's really more about screening. They don't need a sophisticated simulation like McKinsey. Uh, they need efficient and effective screening, right, to find people to do housekeeping at a hotel or front desk uh, or a cash register at a fast food restaurant, et cetera. And uh, the nice thing is the economics for the firm, the new startup are such that once they get that algorithm set, okay, they can do small tweaks to adjust it to uh, hotels versus fast food and then aggregate those small firms and still make money. So those things are coming together and you're gonna see an explosion, I predict over the next five years, for small companies being able to use AI-enabled recruiting tools, especially at the front end of the process. All right, thank you very much, Tiwa. I know you have prepared the wrap-up slide. We have one minute to go, so I suggest that you move on to the wrap-up slide. All right, so here's the final thing to even make you more nervous, right? If remote working becomes a permanent fact or some hybrid, if we do more remote working, whatever that's gonna look like, Okay, one of the biggest obstacles, okay, in changing jobs, relocating will decline or disappear. And as a consequence, switching costs will go down even more, and therefore we can anticipate switching behavior going up. So AI will, this will only reinforce the utility of AI to cope with this additional job churn, okay? 
uh, look, this arms race is brewing. I already see evidence of it. I predict it's only going to get uh, more intense. And the interesting thing is we're going to be left with this dichotomy. On the one hand of high tech, you'll be forced to use AI-enabled recruiting tools. And if you don't, you'll simply leave yourself vulnerable. But you'll only be able to actually get the talent you want to want you and want to stay with you through high touch, uh, authentically human uh, conditions, capabilities, character, et cetera, inside your company. Those are my parting thoughts. All right, thank you, thank you very much, Siwa, for all your insight and lively discussion with our audience. If you wish to learn more about Siwa Research, we will send you some additional reading as well as the slides. The recording will be ready with you very soon. And if you enjoy today, we'll have plenty more tech talks in the pipeline. Thank you very much, everyone.